Good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling to order the Dr. Cog board work session for Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. I am Vice Chair Ashley Stolzman, and uh, we're having this meeting electronically uh, because of COVID-19 and that it's being recorded. First and foremost, I just want to congratulate all the folks who won their elections last night and people who worked on races. If your races won, congratulations. And um, also just to thank everyone for their service and dedication, whether you won your race or not, it's a tremendous commitment that everyone puts in to make sure that the region's a better place. And I'd like to thank everyone on behalf of the entire Dr. Cog staff and Dr. Cog board for service of any members that are term limited or didn't happen to win their races. We'll take attendance this evening um, just with the uh, electronic recording. So we won't do a roll call, but we'll note everyone who's here in attendance and thank you so much for coming. So that takes care of our call to order. We'll now go to public comment. I request that there's no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board of directors. If any members of the public would care to comment, go ahead and raise your hand at this time. Uh, Madam Chair, would you like me to open the lines to see if there's anyone on the phones? That would be great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay, so I am opening up the lines. If there's anyone on the phone for public comment, please hit star six now. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone on the phones and uh, I don't see any hands raised, so I will hand it back to the chair. Thank you all very much. So that takes us to the summary of our September 2, 2020 board work session. You'll find that in attachment A and we'll accept that summary of that attachment which brings us to the proposed fiscally constrained project and program investment priorities for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, or more um, familiarly called the 2050 MVRTP. So I'll turn it over to Jacob Rieger, our Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations to give us a presentation this afternoon. Jacob, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, can folks see my presentation in presentation mode? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So appreciate your time today. Wanted to give you an update on where we are with the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, I'll start by acknowledging that we've given you a tremendous amount of information um, in this packet. Um, that is on purpose. We want to be transparent with you about the work we've been doing. We last checked in with you at your July board meeting where you approved the process for project major project uh, solicitation and evaluation. Um, so we want to kind of show you the results of that work, uh, bring you up to speed with where we're at and what's next. Um, that said, with maybe some minor updates, this is the same information that we'll also present at the um, November uh, formal board meeting. So I think a conversation today will really streamline uh, what we'll have for you in uh, later this month. So um, let me start back just a little bit at the beginning, just as a reminder of context and background here for the 2050 plan. One of the many things that the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan does is it helps implement our larger MetroVision plan. And that was really a foundation for our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan process in the sense of, you know, what are the best set of project and program investments that we can make in this 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, you know, to help implement MetroVision. And at least pre-pandemic back, you know, last spring and summer, when we started the planning process, one of the things that we kind of started with was the notion that based on where we were at the time, the beginning of our journey with the MetroVision plan in terms of the specific transportation targets and measures within MetroVision, we weren't on track at the time to meet most of those. And so again, sort of the, the urgency or the framework of the regional transportation plan, again, how can we sort of strengthen that link with MetroVision? How can we through the regional transportation plan help us get uh, to where we say we wanna be as a region um, as we go forward. Um, particularly for this planning process for the 2050 plan, we had a strategic focus on a few things. Um, as we've just talked about, we help implement the Metro Vision Plan, our regional aspirational vision. Um, a focus on kind of regional policy priorities coming from all the great work that we've done at Dr. Cog and that our partner agencies, our local governments have done over the last few years around safety, uh, regional vision zero, um, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'll talk specifically about House Bill 1261 in a moment. Uh, regional transit, active transportation, and some of the other things that you see there. Um, in the 2050 plan, this is a new thing for us, an explicit programmatic investment addressing some of these priorities. 
So the financial plan for the overall 2050 plan is complex and includes a lot of things, but one of the things that we intentionally wanted to include, and we'll talk about this in a few slides, is some dedicated programmatic dollars in the plan, you know, towards these things that are of regional importance. Um, emphasis on including multimodal projects. Um, again, with our sort of limited uh, financial resources, we want to stretch those dollars as much as we can. So a foundational thing in our planning process was looking for projects that, you know, kind of kind of carry multiple duties. You know, maybe we have a transit project that also really helps with safety, or we have a big operations project that also helps with mobility. Um, whatever it may be, we're looking for those projects that, that can sort of, um, you know, do multiple things in the plan. Um, again, given our limited financial resources and wanting to stretch those dollars. Um, significant public and stakeholder engagement. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well, but, you know, pioneering some groups um, that we're working with as part of the regional transportation plan, you know, in terms of our outreach techniques and things that we've done, you know, certainly before COVID and definitely since COVID, you know, wanting to do, frankly, more and better uh, when it comes to public and stakeholder engagement. And then finally, regional collaboration for the region's transportation plan. Even though Dr. Cog, through federal requirements, kind of takes the lead on this, um, we are the region's transportation planning agency wearing our MPO hat. By the same token, this really is a partnership. And I hope you see that theme of partnership in the plan um, and what we'll present today in terms of working with CDOT, RTD, and the local governments. You know, one primary example of that is our county transportation forums. Uh, we didn't even have those the last time we did a major regional transportation plan update. And so striking that balance between some of these regional things that we say are important, um, but also honoring sort of local context, local process, uh, was really important to us and how we've gotten to this point in the planning process. Um, a little bit of just sort of Federal Requirements 101, um, just to sort of highlight those, there are some things that we need to do in this process as we talk about uh, fiscal constraint and the proposed projects and um, projects and program priorities that we're going to present to you today. We do need to individually identify regionally significant roadway and rapid transit capacity projects. Um, that relates directly to our federal air quality conformity requirements. So those major, major projects, regardless of mode, uh, we do need to identify those. We model those for air quality conformity. As part of that modeling, we need to identify the implementation staging period for each project uh, related to our air quality conformity modeling. Um, a 30-year plan is a snapshot in time. It is a best estimate. But at least within our five or 10-year staging periods, we want to have a sense of when these major projects will open to traffic or open to revenue service. We need to demonstrate reasonable availability of revenues to fund project and program investments. Um, the federal term there is fiscal constraint or cost feasibility. We need to be able to say over the life of this plan, these major projects, these major programs that we want to include in the plan, you know, do we think collectively that we will have the federal, state, regional, and local revenues to, uh, to fund those projects over time? And then there's other federal requirements that I won't get into today, but lots of other federal requirements governing our planning process and some of the products that we'll produce related to the 2050 plan. Um, just real quick on process here, again, back in July, the board approved our, uh, the process that we've been using to solicit and evaluate um, candidate major you know, priority projects. Um, Dr. Cog's staff scored those candidate projects using the primary objectives from the Metro Vision Plan. Um, that's one of the attachments to kind of show um, how that scoring broke out. Um, then we also had a regional evaluation panel that provided input um, on that work, and we'll talk about the regional evaluation panel in a couple slides. Then from there, we went into what we call the interagency process, um, which was really Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD working together to take all of that input that we've received through the planning process, kind of marry that up or integrate that with the um, draft 2050 financial plan that's really driven by the revenues and expenditures of the three agencies and kind of marry those two together um, to recommend project and program investment priorities, as you see in the middle of the screen, which is where we are today. Um, we did uh, bring these to our Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, both on October 5th and October 26th. Um, on October 26th, it was a recommended action. They did recommend unanimously um, to approve the, you know, carry these uh, project and program investment priorities forward. Um, and of course, we will bring them to the Regional Transportation Committee and the Dr. Khan Board later this month. Once we get through that step um, over on the right, um, then the next major set of things that we'll be working on is some of the technical work around conducting the air quality conformity modeling analysis for this plan, um, drafting the content for the plan document. We are aiming to have a draft 2050 plan document available um, early in 2021, let's call it the beginning of February uh, for public and stakeholder review. 
Um, this slide, you've seen a version of this before, so I'm not going to belabor it. The point here is that really the 2050 plan, as I said at the beginning, is really trying to take um, into account all of the great work that's been done, not to Dr. Cog, um, but the local governments, RTD, CDOT, some federal things as well, and kind of roll that up together. Um, because this, as you, the things that you see on our slide, really is collectively sort of the framework and the vision for this region in terms of what's important to us, what are our priorities, what are the things that we think we need, um, and that's what we that's what we use as our template, um, as our framework to start putting this plan together. I will highlight one of the relatively new things, uh, House Bill 1261, uh, relating to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we've been following that closely. You all had a, recently had a presentation on it. Um, we've been incorporating, I think, from the very beginning, uh, the intent and sort of the direction of House Bill 1261 into the work that we're doing uh, with the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. The notion of air quality and greenhouse gas emissions is something that is one of our uh, foundational targets and measures within the Metro Vision Plan. So while that's still work in progress, uh, we're trying to incorporate that as much as we possibly can into uh, the 2050 plan as we go forward. So I'm going to pause there. We're about a third of the way through the presentation. I want to pause for any initial uh, sort of questions uh, before we go further. Madam Chair. Thank you. If any directors have questions at this time, please raise your hand so we can get to call on. First question comes from Director Brockett. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Jacob, thanks for that. Um, well, since you paused right there, I had a question about the 1261 uh, greenhouse gas um, uh, targets. So I really appreciate, uh, glad to hear that you are taking those into account in this planning. But I know we don't yet have kind of quantitative measures to do that with yet is my understanding. So like, I, I hear that you're keeping it in mind, but do you have a sense of how we might quantitatively be able to hit those targets with, with this plan? Or, or do we need more rulemaking to be done before we'll know that? Um, thank you, Director. Oh, sorry, Madam Chair. Oh, great. I was just calling on you. Please dialogue. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Director Brockett. Um, I think the short answer is both, um, but let me elaborate just a little bit on that. So, yes, it's still in progress. We don't have uh, some of the qual quantitative or numerical guidance from the 1261 process just yet. Um, to be truthful and transparent, we're not going to have it in time that we need to adopt this plan. And I will, I was going to cover this at the end, but I will make this point now. We are under a federal deadline uh, for getting this plan adopted and for having um, Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration actually certify this plan, which they need to do by June 27th, 2021. So we are under the gun, uh, so to speak, on getting this plan adopted. That said, um, again, from the beginning, I think we've been trying to carry the intent forward of air quality, greenhouse gas emissions into this plan. Uh, we are about to, as I said, embark on our air quality conformity analysis. Um, we will be able to do, I think, some greenhouse gas emissions analysis as part of sort of that recommended plan network. Um, you know, planning, long-range planning is a snapshot in time, and not just with House Bill 1261, but with Reimagine RTD, with some of the work we've been doing around Regional Vision Zero. You know, we try and capture all of that as much as we can at the time that we adopt the plan, but we do anticipate, you know, using Reimagine RTD as an example in the next couple of years once that process picks up and completes, um, coming back and doing a major plan amendment. So we have the same opportunity to do that once we have some final guidance on House Bill 1261 as well. Good to know. Thanks for that answer. Thank you. Other members have questions or comments at this point. Director Peck, you are self-muted. There we go. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, report. I'm um, just piggybacking on what Director Brockett said. Uh, there was the House Bill 191261 was passed last year to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Are we following those guidelines that by um, from 2005, we were going to reduce the levels from 2005 by 26% by 2025, 50% by 50% by 2030, and 90% by 2050? according to the uh, House Bill 191261. Are we going to follow those guidelines as well? Mr. Rieger? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Director Peck, so really just piggybacking on uh, my answer to Director Brockett, we don't yet have the full sort of 
technical guidance, quantitative guidance and targets from House Bill 1261 relating to surface transportation today that we can indirectly incorporate in the plan. Um, but yes, in, in that broad sense, we are doing as much as we can and incorporating as much as we can, as much as we know at this time from House Bill 1261, again, with the opportunity when it becomes more, more definitive and more in focus that we can come back and do uh, plan amendments as needed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Director Peck. Any other questions or comments to this point? Seeing none, we'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Rieger. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm actually gonna call on my colleague, Alvin Vidal Sanchez to do the next part of the presentation. Alvin? Thanks, Jacob. So I'll provide an overview of the solicitation and evaluation process. Uh, through the process that we approved and adopted through the committees and the all the board, we ended up getting 137 total candidate projects. Uh, looking at how that breaks down from our county transportation forums and our mountain counties, Clear Creek and Gilpin, we ended up getting 107 projects. Working with CDOT regions one and four, we got about 25 and RTD, we got five. Uh, ultimately, this ended up being about $6.4 billion in request. Uh, Obviously, we wouldn't be able to fund that full amount. Uh, we had a larger gap that we would need to bring down for fiscal constraint, but of the 137, we did receive about 6.4 in full requests. Next. So the process for evaluating those projects was uh, qualitative scoring. We had a diverse a diverse group of staff from Dr. Cog score each of those 137 projects using these qualitative metrics that come from our Metro Vision Plan objectives. So you can see uh, with each of these objectives, there were a certain number of points allotted to them. Uh, if a project had a uh, was meeting these objectives very well, they got three points for high, uh, one point for low. So one of the attachments that you saw is the how those scores fleshed out, both in terms of average scores. So how do they average out of the 51 points and then cumulative scores. Um, I believe that was around 300 points. And then one additional piece that we added to our evaluation was any rankings that were provided by the forums. So not every county transportation forum did provide rankings of their projects, but when those were available, we did also include that in the attachment we provided. So you can see how those scores for each of the 137 projects rank in terms of average, cumulative, and the corresponding rank by county transportation forum. After the scoring by staff, the first group to actually see that was our regional evaluation panel. Uh, this group was made up of a representative from each of our county transportation forums, and then a representative from our mountain counties, Clear Creek and Gilpin, and then staff from Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. They ended up meeting twice in September. Uh, we kept the task towards them pretty broad, just to see what any see what guidance, any direction they wanted to give to the next step in the process, which is what we were calling our interagency process where Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD staff ended up bringing all the different input together and starting to make some decisions to get to fiscal constraint. Uh, ultimately, they ended up recommending that all 137 projects move forward into the next step. So that was uh, where the three agencies just continued to look at all 137 and no projects were trimmed in that first regional evaluation panel step. Some of the overarching guidance we received from them was to look at multimodal projects, which is something you've already heard discussed by Jacob, and projects that were helping with multiple benefits. So they were helping with congestion, safety, and provided multiple benefits to the region and the community. And one last piece of guidance was also just making sure that we were keeping a balance of projects across the region, making sure we were keeping regional equity in mind as projects were selected for fiscal constraint within the RTP. In addition to the regional evaluation panel guidance, we've also been bringing to bear a lot of other input that we've received throughout the plan process. So I won't go through each of these, but uh, two that I do wanna bring out that you might not have heard or seen before. Uh, in addition to the scoring, the advisory groups and the process that's been laid out, uh, we did also do some travel demand estimates where we were able to, for specific projects, just to have an extra level of information as we're making these decisions. And I would say the last key piece of information was our Transportation Advisory Committee meeting back in October 5th. Uh, you'll see how some of that feedback actually helped shape our program investment strategy moving forward. So that was a summary of the solicitation and evaluation process. Uh, if there are any questions, we're happy to answer that before we move into 
the next last third of the presentation. Thank you for that. That was very helpful. Any questions at this point? I don't see any hands raised, but if you have questions at this point, go ahead and put them up at this time. All right, thank you. There are no questions. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So let's talk about kind of, you know, where has that all gotten us and, and where do we go from here? So again, what you have in front of you today is um, really our proposed project, major project and program investment priorities for uh, the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. So these are, again, those major projects that the feds require that we individually identify, other major projects, multimodal projects that we wanted to show in the plan, um, and then some of those programmatic things reflecting uh, the region's policy priorities that I talked about. I will note a couple of things here. One is that the overall 2050 financial plan will include um, not just those things, but other things as well. Um, you know, the overall financial plan does include sort of everything that goes into both the revenues and expenditures to operate, maintain, expand, improve, evolve our multimodal transportation system. So even things like, um, you know, basic roadway operations, maintenance, uh, local sidewalks, those things that we wouldn't individually identify will be part of the overall financial plan um, when the when the draft 2050 plan is published early next year. Um, but today we're focusing again on those major project and program um, investment priorities. So those include um, those include the ones that um, we work through in the process that we've been talking about today, the 137 candidate projects. Also include some projects that were carryover from the 2040 uh, regional transportation plan. A couple of quick points on those. Some of those projects are actually under construction. They're soon to open, you know, almost complete. Um, and so when you look at the attachments on some of those, you'll see sort of a zero cost estimate associated with them. And you might wonder, well, why is that? The reason for that is because from a sort of financial plan budgetary perspective, those projects have already been accounted for through our 2040 plan. We don't need to carry those over to 2050. But because they will be opening during our 2050 plan period, we do need to reflect them in our model network and for air quality conformity. Um, some of those projects are also some large projects that carry over um, uh, into the 2050 plan. And so uh, we're trying to reflect all of those as well. And then we have the new regionally funded projects, which is the planning work that we've been doing um, that we've been talking about in this presentation over the last few months. And then we also have the locally funded projects. So these are projects that, and we'll have a slide on this, but these are projects that local governments um, are committing to fund um, as part of the plan during the planning period. Um, so let's start with the program side of, um, of the recommended uh, project and program investment strategies. Again, the point here is that we wanted to intentionally show dollars in the planning period over the next 30 years going towards some of these regional priorities. So just to briefly walk through these, uh, we started with our existing TIP set-asides. Um, as you may know, we have four TIP set-asides. Let's see if I get them right. Regional Transportation Operations and Technology, Community Mobility Planning and Implementation, uh, Transportation Demand Management, or TDM, and then Human Service Transportation. So those names and, and you know, sort of those labels may change over the 30-year plan period, but those set-asides represent priorities of Dr. Cog, and they represent priorities of the region. So we wanted to reflect that going forward. Um, RTD recently completed the Regional BRT Feasibility Study. Um, we think that the long-range plan is an important next step to help implement that study, and so we've dedicated uh, some dollars towards some specific uh, bus rapid transit corridors, and you'll see that on the project list in the attachments to this item. We also recognize that there's some other corridors either that couldn't be fully addressed by the Regional BRT Study or other corridors that you know, are important, they're priorities, um, we want to carry those, those corridors forward. They may not be quite as far along as some of the BRT corridors, um, but they are worthy of, of investment and attention in the plan. So we've dedicated some dollars towards those corridors. Um, we talked a little bit about safety and uh, regional vision zero, um, you know, clearly a priority. We want to, we want to be intentional about dedicating uh, some dollars towards, um, towards uh, safety and regional vision zero projects in the long range plan carrying forward the work that we've done in our Regional Vision Zero plan, that CDOT has done on their uh, Strategic Transportation Safety Plan, and even the work that's going on right now with Safer Main Streets. You know, can we take that Safer Main Streets model, that partnership, and that focus on safety and carry that forward through the plan? Similarly, um, Dr. Cog, as well as local governments and others, have, have adopted active transportation plans in the last year or two. We want to reflect that as a policy priority. Um, 
here's some input from our October 5th TAC meeting. Um, you know, both CDOT and Dr. Cog have recently completed multimodal freight plans. Uh, freight, you know, TAC said is an area of emphasis. So we wanted to include some dollars programmatically towards freight. And then, as I mentioned, we also have the carryover projects from our 2040 plan. So that's kind of the major program side of the shop. Um, and then let's start talking about the projects. Um, the table on the right of this slide um, shows that sort of rough allocation in terms of total, total project and major program dollars by county um, that we're proposing for the 2050 plan. Um, it's not exact, and there's a lot of caveats here in the sense that you have projects that cost, that, uh, excuse me, that cross county lines. You know, it's a little bit hard to quantify this because are you looking at sort of total requested? Are you looking at the percent of, you know, requested versus received? Um, you know, how do you deal with the carryover projects from 2040? There are three carryover projects in particular that are really big dollar interstate projects that skew this a little bit. So, et cetera, et cetera. But we at least wanted to give a sense of um, how this how this broke out sort of regionally because that idea of regional equity, what is important as part of this planning process. So as it says on the left, this includes the project funding from all three regional agencies. It includes the programmatic funding that I just talked about. It includes the carryover projects from the 2040 plan. Um, and as I said, several projects span multiple counties. So we try to account for that as well. We also wanted to show um, sort of the the types of projects that we're investing, we're proposing to invest in of these major projects for the 2050 plan. Again, some caveats here, and remember what I said at the beginning of this presentation, really we're looking for multimodal projects that can do multiple things. So it's a little bit hard to categorize them into, stratify them into these buckets because there are projects that do multiple things here. Um, but uh, we at least wanted to show you that overall sort of planning level breakdown of the major projects that we're proposing for the plan. Um, I will note a couple things here. Um, on the interstate freeway side, those are primarily managed lane uh, projects or almost exclusively managed lane projects in this in this plan. And when we were talking with the local government stakeholder, that was kind of an aha moment uh, for that person. So, you know, thought that was worth pointing out. Uh, CDOT has a policy around managed lanes. Um, so we're trying to, again, sort of bring that forward uh, into the regional transportation plan. Um, and I will note that, you know, the 137 candidate projects um, was really a very diverse set of projects. And again, even sort of roadway capacity type projects, which you know are needed in some places. Um, our region is gonna grow by, um, by over a million folks over the next 20, you know, over the next 30 years. But even those projects have multimodal elements to them. Um, and again, you know, trying to reflect here based on the programmatic side of things that, you know, the things that we say are important in terms of active transportation, safety and freight, you know, those are showing up in the projects as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about staging periods that I mentioned previously, that that's a federal requirement for air quality conformity. Um, we do need to perform air quality conformity analysis by air quality staging periods. We will have four staging periods in this plan, 2020 to 2029, 2030 to 39, 2040 to 2045, uh, to sync up with CDOT's uh, statewide plan, which is a 2045 plan, and then 2045 to 2050. We need to demonstrate reasonable distribution of project costs with available revenues by fiscal constraint funding tiers. So what that means in plain English is that there's a federal requirement that, you know, we all know we want our projects as quickly as we can in this 30 year planning period, but we need to show some level of reasonable distribution of projects and revenues and costs associated with those projects over, um, over the 30 years of this plan. And that's what this little chart um, is showing in the middle of the slide. Um, finally, based on final fiscal constraint status, we are asking for some limited discretion to work with project sponsors to adjust project staging as needed. Um, haven't seen a need for that just yet, but it is, it is possible that as we finalize this list, maybe one or two projects uh, for one reason or another might need to shift between staging periods. Um, I mentioned locally funded projects. Um, these came primarily from the 2040 plan with two rounds of sponsored modifications. So it was one of the first things we did in our planning process was to reach out um, to local government project sponsors. And then we did it again uh, within the last month just to give folks an opportunity to update those projects or change those projects. Locally funded projects do include toll highway authority projects. Um, and we have reached out um, and had conversations with um, all three of the toll highway authorities in the region, um, particularly with E470. We had to sit down with them in early October uh, to make sure that we were accurately reflecting their master plan um, and their intentions for um, their network um, over the 30-year span of this, of, this, of this transportation plan. 
Um, regional funding recommendations may modify proposed locally funded project lists. So what that means is that once uh, the Dr. Cog board, uh, once you all, you know, sort of finalize this list and hopefully approve this list later in November, uh, we will go back to project sponsors of projects that maybe didn't make it in this sort of regional list and ask them if they want to fund it uh, from local funds. So uh, we are asking for just a little bit of um, discretion there to finalize that locally funded project list based on the action that you take um, hopefully later this month. Um, and then finally, I think this is my last slide. You've seen a version of this slide before kind of laying out our overall project schedule. Uh, won't go through this in extreme detail, but again, to make the point, um, the feds have to certify this plan by late June of 2021. So we are tentatively aiming uh, for board adoption in April um, in, order to, uh, in order to meet that milestone and have our public review uh, and engagement process and our public hearing. Uh, essentially, we are aiming to have a draft document available uh, for regional review, as I said, in early 2021. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on the schedule side. And yep, that's it. So um, happy to talk about, you know, didn't, didn't specifically focus on the attachments, uh, but we can bring those up and happy to talk about those as needed, but wanted to give you a sense of the planning process, where we're at and where we think we're going. And with that, Madam Chair, happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you. So any folks who have questions or a conversation, I can imagine uh, back if we were meeting in the boardroom, there would be a lively discussion about this presentation. And so don't be shy. Go ahead and raise your hand. I know it takes a little bit of extra effort with these virtual meetings, but we can have the good dialogue here. And if it helps for some dialogue, we could put that funding slide back up that shows which how much money each county got. That'll, that'll get some good dialogue going. <laughs> so the first hand raised comes from Director Atchison. Jacob, as, as I've been looking at this, this looks like we're still very much on schedule from what we had previously presented. Um, yes, sir, we are definitely trying to stay on schedule. Director Atchison? That's good, thank you. All right. Thank you so much for trying to stay on schedule during all of this craziness too. We all really appreciate that. Thank you, Jacob and to the other staff members that have worked on it as well. Thank you all. Any other comments or questions? All right, just to see if there's any other discussion on it, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting up the slide that shows the share of projects by type, Mr. Rieger. See if there's any comment or question. Uh, Director Brockett. Great, and so Jacob, just so that we're clarifying where we are in the process. So we just have a, asking questions, having some general conversation. How are you going to take feedback from today and, and kind of move this for process forward? What are you looking for us uh, from for from us today? Yeah, that's a good question, Director Brockett. So a couple of things. First is again, we want to be transparent about the work that we've done, and so. As I started with this presentation, I'm cognizant that we've dumped a lot of a lot of information and, and a lot of um, a lot of work on you. So, a you know, really, we wanted you to see it and have a chance to react to it. Um, all the work that's been done through the process that you approved um, at your July board meeting and the partnership work that we've done with uh, local government and other stakeholders since that time. So that's one important thing we wanted to accomplish today. If there are questions about um, you know, specific projects or, um, you know, really anything that we're presenting today, um, you, you know, any sort of changes that are, that are requested, you know, we want that sort of um, feedback as well so that we can, you, you know, by the time it comes to you at RTC and board, um, that we're bringing sort of the latest, um, you know, latest information in terms of what we're asking you to approve. As it stands from the October 26 TAC meeting, we are working with stakeholders on a couple very specific, very targeted things on one or two projects, just to clarify a couple of those projects. We'll have those uh, ready for uh, RTC. Um, but otherwise, as I said at the beginning, what, we're, what we've presented to you today and what's in this packet is what we anticipate presenting to you at the board meeting. Um, but we wanted to kind of go through the detail today, um, as I said, to streamline your conversation at the November board meeting. Great. So, Thanks. Thanks for that. I'll, so I'll just throw in a, a couple quick comments. I just feel like this is very much on the right track. I really appreciate the kind of uh, additional uh, categories that you've included here um, with the um, Vision Zero and the active transportation. The freight is a good thing as well. Um, love to see those BRT corridors get funded. So lots of great things 
um, in this plan. Thank you for bringing this forward and talking it over with us. And just to put a uh, just a placeholder, or a, um, a flag on that thing that we were talking about before about the 1261. Um, Greenhouse gas targets, um, totally understand we need to stay on track for adoption of this on uh, the schedule that the feds have for next year. Um, but just to keep us thinking about how we will incorporate those targets and the, um, the metrics and the specific quantitative methodologies that the, the, they come up with uh, once those are available and how we can bring those back to uh, you know, this plan um, once we have those, uh, those numbers available to us. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for that, Director Broughton. Thank you. That's great. So our next director with comments or questions is Director Peck. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Um, this is actually a concern for my staff, and it, it has to do with the investment package. We have a, a very concentrated effort on uh, the regional Vision Zero, um, and we're, we're wondering how are very concerned about the number of ro roadway widenings in that investment package. So the question is, with all of these widenings, uh, we'll expand uh, the higher, the regional high injury network. Will we be getting more injuries with the widening of these uh, highways with these projects? Mr. Rieger? Yeah, thank you, Director Peck. So yes, there are some capacity and there's some widening projects in this plan. Um, again, we are a diverse region and we're a growing region. Um, but again, when we evaluated these projects, you know, safety was one of the things that we evaluated the monic, a qualitative evaluation, um, but it was part of the evaluation matrix of, of those projects. And again, we were really pleased with the caliber of projects that we received from the county transportation forums in terms of even some of these roadway projects. You know, we're multimodal in the sense of really paying attention to you know, how can we make this the, the sort of best project that it can possibly be? So we are very attuned to safety. We will be including a lot of the regional Vision Zero work in terms of the high injury network, uh, the critical corridors, specific projects dedicated towards safety. And yes, we absolutely want this plan to contribute towards helping us meet our safety outcomes and helping us get to zero. Um, and that is one of the foundational, um, foundational sort of measures of framework of, of putting this plan together. And will we have a comparative analysis from uh, on that high injury network after the highways are widened? Jacob, this is Ron. Can I do you mind yeah. if I chime in a little bit? Sure. Sorry, um, uh, Councilwoman Pack, Ron Papsor for the group director of uh, transportation planning and operations. I did want to chime in because it's a really important issue. Um, I think you all are well aware we are extremely committed to our Vision Zero goals. Um, we are committed to implementing the Vision Zero plan and driving towards um, eliminating transportation fatalities in this region. Um, mm -hmm. That said, it's very, very difficult to model and predict sort of what action might have um, kind of on, on crashes or uh, fatal crashes. Um, we also uh, place an important priority on not just what projects are included in the plan and funded, but how they're designed and how they're built. And that's, that's as important, right? And so um, one of our first action steps from the Vision Zero plan is to do a complete streets toolkit for the region. That work is underway now uh, by transportation planning staff uh, in Jacob's shop. And uh, that will be a really important component and will give us some guidance about um, how to design street projects and, and facility projects to actually make them safer and more efficient and more multimodal. So uh, we're, we're committed to those efforts. Um, you know, as Jacob said very articulately, there are, there are different needs in different parts of this region, but there, are, but there are safety needs and there are multimodal needs in every corner of this region. And uh, we believe this plan helps us achieve those goals. Thank you, Ron. Any other questions or comments from members? Director Maurer. Oops, sorry, I, I muted you, sorry about that. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good deal. Um, I, I just um, was wondering um, about equity um, amongst the counties and so forth. 
Um, just one of my members that asked about uh, Arapahoe County versus other counties and how that was taken into account. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Director Maurer. Um, again, so, you know, regional equity is never going to be exact um, across the region, particularly for a 30 year long range plan, as opposed to say a four year transportation improvement program. But um, it was an important consideration for us. I've come back to the slide where you can see uh, kind of those numbers, um, you know, uh, by county for the region. Um, we wanted to make sure that, um, again, in a plan like this, and when we had to close a big fiscal constraint gap, not everyone's going to get everything they want, but hopefully most folks are getting most things that, that they're identified as priorities. One of the things that we did here is, and this is true for Arapahoe County, most but not all the forums did rank their project submittals to us, their candidate projects. We really respected those rankings and we were trying to reach fiscal constraint. Uh, one of the things that we tried to do is to prioritize the highest ranked candidate projects in each county. So I think for Arapahoe County, uh, we were able to do that. And I think Arapahoe County came out fairly well in terms of regional equity, um, in terms of sort of the proportion of investment uh, within Arapahoe County. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Director Mulvey. Thank you. To follow up on that same um, point made as to regional equity, um, noticing in Douglas County, it's one of the largest and fastest growing counties in the Denver metro region. But we recognize that, uh, particularly with my area, that the the growth is underway and it's not to be realized for another 15 to 20 years in total. And so my question is, as a relative newbie, is how does this list, if at all, get adjusted? Thank you. I, I'm not sure you finished, but just how does this list get adjusted over time? Director Reaver? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Director Mulvey. So a couple things here. Uh, we're federally required to do a major update of this plan every four years. So this planning process that we've been describing today, uh, we'll be doing this again in four years. And that's that's on purpose to sort of have that check in. You know, things change quickly. And in a growing region like ours, things, you know, things change very quickly. So we do have that opportunity to update the plan every four years. We do amendments in between, so what we call kind of regular cycle amendments. And we typically do those about annually. So we recognize that in a 30 year plan and some of the projects in this plan that some of them are pretty definite. As I said, some are even under construction, some are more conceptual. And as those projects kind of work their way through and they get better defined, um, and they get into the tip, you know, the plan sort of changes through updates and amendments to kind of, you know, incorporate that and, and, um, and, to, and to understand that. By the same token, priorities change you know, demographics change, other things change. So again, we do this every four years to kind of catch up on what's important to the region and what's important within the region uh, for a long range transportation plan. Thank you. Um, so Director Rieger, or Mr. Rieger, um, Director Mulvey lost audio. So if you could touch base with her offline, um, just to let her know how the plan gets updated, that would be fantastic. And then if somebody from staff could please uh, go into the question box and work with Director Mulvey to restore uh, whatever's wrong with their system. That would be helpful. Any uh, other? I'm back and I'll oh. connect back with Jacob. I do appreciate that. I don't know what okay, happened. Did you, did you hear my answer, Director Mulvey, or do you need me to repeat it? I heard the end. I don't want to take up too much time of the group, so I'll catch up with you offline. Thank okay. you. I will follow up with you. Thank you. I'm so sorry that happened. I'm not sure what happened and I'm sorry we lost you. And to anybody who suffers technical difficulties with any of these meetings, I'm, it's just so frustrating. I'm sorry about all that. And hopefully we can meet back in person soon enough. That is my dream. Um, any other questions or comments from folks? Madam Chair, this is, this is Ron. Do you mind if I chime in a little bit? Please do. Yeah, because Jacob was absolutely right um, with Director Moby's question. And, you know, we were, we um, we struggled with this table, um, quite frankly, right? Because it it can be a little distorted, and it can it can be a little distorted because within the mix of these projects, we tried to capture sort of all the major investments that are included in this proposed in this in this proposed investment plan, which include 
several really significant and really expensive CDOT freeway projects, right? And, and toll managed lane projects. And Jacob talked about that a little bit earlier, but we, we did our best to sort of assign those investments to, to the counties where they were occurring. But the truth is they're big regional investments that have regional benefits. Um, so I just want everyone to understand that, you know, this is, this is, we wanted to be transparent about this. We knew this would be a question but it is also a little, it, it distorts a little bit sort of truly um, kind of how the investments are happening around the region in different parts of the region. And this isn't, this isn't a budget document, it's not a tip, this is a long range plan. We're trying to put together the best package of sort of regional investments to meet our regional transportation objectives as identified in MetroVision and uh, in partnership with, with CDOT and RTD and, and all our local governments. So, um, Really important piece of information, but I want to put some context around it too for all of you to understand. Thank you for that additional feedback, uh, Mr. Papstorf. That's really helpful. Do any other members have comments or questions this afternoon? All right, I think we have been set up in a really good position for our board meeting when this comes forward and really appreciate all the extra explanation and going into the detail with us this afternoon. If people think of questions after the fact, they can always get in contact with staff members offline and get their questions and comments um, to staff in that way as well. So thank you all so much for joining us. And um, with that, we will adjourn for the evening. See you all at the board meeting. <laughs>